Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I believe we are supposed to start now, so I might get, get going with this. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, my name is Chris. Uh, as you might be able to tell from my accent, I am not from around here. I'm actually from Australia, and uh, I have been told that sometimes I speak very quickly. So I'm going to try and slow down, but if you find that uh, I'm not comprehensible, please raise your hand, ask me to slow down. I won't take offense, I promise. Today we are going to be talking about test-driven development and domain-driven design. Uh, I'm going to be demonstrating to you how I practice these things. Uh, I'm not very dogmatic about them. I'm not going to tell you that it's exactly what you should do, um, but perhaps there might be some ideas in here that you can take away. A little bit about myself to start with. Uh, I was previously a co-founder in, in a startup in Australia. Um, we launched two businesses. I now do a lot of work coaching startups, uh, as well as I became very passionate and interested in domain-driven design. So I spent a lot of time working with companies, helping them review their architecture, modernizing their systems and design, um, and now get to do a lot of speaking at events like this, which is a lot of fun. Uh, one thing that I drew me to domain-driven design is, I think, coming from that startup context, I was always very interested in helping the technology be something that really drove business outcomes and working at that intersection of where the technology uh, and the business uh, come together. So, like I said, we're going to be using test-driven development. The inspiration for this talk came from a domain-driven design talk I gave where someone at the end said, this sounds fantastic if you have a very complex domain, uh, but what about if you think at the start that your domain is very simple and you, so you don't adopt domain-driven design uh, and then later on you find out actually it's quite complex. And I thought that's a great idea to demonstrate how I approach these sort of systems, uh, starting uh, in a way that's very simple and then building up the complexity as we go. So we're going to be looking at a very simple domain. It's possibly one that you've come across before uh, in a, a practical exercise or something, some sort of uh, university enrollment system. So in our traditional uh, entity relationship diagram, we have a student uh, who's related to a course there because they've enrolled in the course. Uh, the course is assigned to a room. The room has a capacity. And this is the primary constraint that we're going to need to enforce in our system. Uh, we're going to try and make sure that the course does not get over-enrolled because if it does, there won't be enough space in the room uh, for students to attend that course. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Obviously, you wouldn't bother with domain-driven design, you just go straight into building a pretty straightforward CRUD application. We're going to be using test-driven development. Who here uses test-driven development in their day-to-day -day practice? Yeah, three people? Cool. <laughs> I, um, you know, sometimes the numbers are a bit bigger, but they have been lower. Um, I hope that if you're not using it uh, after this, you might be motivated to give it a try. If you're not familiar with it, the idea is that we start by writing a test, we make the test pass, and then we do some refactoring. It's very straightforward. The thing that I think confuses people a lot is that often this is described as write a unit test. So who can tell me what does the word unit mean when I say unit test? Any thoughts? A block, yeah. So sometimes, sometimes people say like a unit of the code, so like a class or a method, and sometimes people say a unit of functionality or behavior. Uh, personally, I lean towards the unit of behavior end of the spectrum. I find it leads to uh, much simpler code, and I'll explain why as we're going. So now it's time to actually get into the code. Now, I have here a very straightforward application. Is this zoomed in enough? Can everyone read this? I can potentially, I thought I moved it to, Oh, we're still at 100%. Let's make that 150. Usually works better on a presentation. Here we go. Cool. So we're starting with a very blank boilerplate application. This is using Spring Boot. Um, we just used the initialization, uh, Spring Boot initializer. I've actually stored here uh, the script that I used to build it. Um, so there's not much in here. It's just the university API application. We're going to be building API tests. Now, it's going to take a while for me to type all this stuff out, so I'm not going to make you watch me type it and make typos and backspace and all that sort of stuff. But what I have is a uh, script that will allow me to progress through the repository. I'll share the link to the repository at the end, and you can see each one of these steps as an individual commit in the repository. So when I said we start by writing a test, I meant it. And when I start, said we start by writing a test for a unit of behavior, I meant that too. So let's write our first. Um, uh, script. We start a test for registering a new student. So we have a student tests, and the test is very straightforward. We're just saying, given I am a student, when I register, it should register a new student. 
Now, as you can see here, all we're doing is um, submitting a post to the URL, localhost slash students, and asserting that the response is created. This is a unit of behavior. It's the smallest unit of behavior I could think of where I could write a test and meaningfully have to do some work to make it pass. Because as you'll see right now, it's not going to pass because we don't have a student controller. We have nothing that's actually going to respond to this. So indeed, if I look at the differences in the assertions, uh, we're expecting a created response and we're getting a not found. Not unsurprising. One of the things I remind people about TDD is that it's not actually a bad thing for a test to go red if you expect it to go red. What's most important is that the tests go the color that you expect them to. It shows that you know what's going on. So let's move forward, and we're going to implement a really basic um, controller, which at this point in the application is the simplest thing I need to make that test pass. All it's going to do uh, is return a string, which is actually going to be in, um, in a null located uh, location header, but with a created response here, uh, returning back an empty string body. Obviously, this is not enough for me to send this application to our customers, but it is enough to make the test pass, and that allows me to move forward in my TDD cycle. Unit of behavior, very small unit of behavior. So we're going to add a new test to assert that the now it allocates an ID for the student when they register. Now we have to actually get um, a response payload and parse it into a student response class and assert that we're getting back a, a UID and we say it's not equal to the empty UUID and it's not null. So of course that's going to fail this time because it's going to try and parse an empty string, uh, which is not going to work. So let's look at the controller. And now we've got a student object and we're just returning that student object with a new random UUID, which is enough to make the test pass. Last time I didn't do any refactoring because it was really so simple, but now I'm looking at this and I'm thinking actually there's an opportunity to do a bit of refactoring. Um, this is where I start to introduce some domain-driven design principles. So I asked before who's using TDD. Is anybody in the audience using DDD, domain-driven design? Yep, two people, even less than TDD, wow. Um, so one of the key principles of domain-driven design is language. It's the language of your customers, and they call it the ubiquitous language, and the idea is that as you learn about the language that your customers use, you should try and embody that language into your code base. And I've already started doing this in a simple way. Who would have expected a controller method that is handling a post operation to be called either post or create? By default, that's what you see, right? In most beginner's applications or tutorials, you'll see a post mapping and then a method called create or post. Create or post are very technical terms for what we're doing here, but what we're doing in the domain is we're registering a new student, so I've called it register a new student. Now there's another opportunity here to refactor it because we've now got here a new student and we've got a public constructor. One thing I really like is uh, named constructors, which is often called a um, static factory method. So by putting a register static factory method, I can now say new student equals student.register. I'm using the language of the domain and then I'm returning that new student. And this is nice because as there gets more complex operations involved in creating the student, uh, they can just go straight into this register operation, more things involved in, in the student being registered. So uh, I'm gonna double check that my refactor hasn't broken any of the tests, and as you expect, it hasn't. So let's go back to our tests, and we're going to update the test to assert on the location of the header. So now we've got in our original test, given my student, when I register, it should register a new student, it should allocate a new ID, it should show where to locate the new student. So we're just asserting now that the expect, we expect on the header that the location matches uh, the expected URL of the student. Obviously, this is going to fail because when we did the original implementation, we didn't do anything about the location header. Sometimes when I show this kind of really fine-grained micro-test TDD style to people, they get a bit impatient. They're like, I could have just added that location header when I was first writing the controller. I know how to do it. I should have just done it then. It would have saved time. My experience is, spoiler, it does not save time. The more things you do in one step, the more likely one of them is going to be a mistake, and the longer it is before you find that there's a mistake, and the harder it is then to find that mistake. This TDD approach, where we literally do one slight change, one slight implementation, um, means that it's very obvious to me every time if something goes wrong. I'm showing you a demo here which is pre-prepared, so obviously things are generally going right, but I can guarantee when I prepared this, I often, they often didn't go right. The first attempt that I had at implementation failed, and it took me a minute to realize what I was doing wrong, but the tests had my back every step of the way. So yeah, this one failed because we didn't have the um, student uh, header, we're just doing created with null. So let's move forwards and um, update our controller now. So we're constructing the location header using this servlet URI components builder. 
um, building and expanding it with the student ID. We've already registered the student so we can get the ID off it. Uh, and then we return that location in the header. And now we're going to get passing tests. This is also a wonderful solution for if you're working in an environment where you get to the end of your task and you say to your boss, oh, I'd just like to add some tests, and they say there's no time, just ship it, you can come back and do the test later, and then you never come back and do the test later. I never find that problem because I'm writing the test as I go, so by the time I say it's done, the tests are already there, and I never have to ask permission to write tests, which is quite nice. And believe it or not, the time I spend writing the tests is immediately saved in not having to go diagnosing problems that have sprung up while I was working on the implementation. So I'm a big believer that this is actually more efficient, more time effective in terms of delivering actual outcomes, even though it might seem that you're spending more time writing the tests. So next test, we're going to assert that we're starting to actually get some results back from this API, because we've just been doing the details so far. So in student tests, we now say, actually, it should um, confirm the student details, so now we can um, uh, get the student request, get the student response, which I think we're parsing somewhere. Uh, yep, new student is here, because we're getting that from the new ID. Uh, see how I like how the new ID does the parsing of the student class, so we get the response body, we can return this student response object, and then we can assert here that the name of the student, we've now added a name field, is equal to the student request name field. Obviously, that's going to fail because the implementation doesn't have anything to do with the name in it yet. This is an interesting moment to point out that I've quite deliberately separated the class that I use for my response object that I'm using in the tests, which now does have an ID and a name, from the class that I'm using in my implementation, which still, at this point, only has an ID. I do see this sometimes where people accidentally refer to the real class, or maybe it's a DTO, maybe it's an entity model in their tests, and you lose then the opportunity to discover a problem in your API if you go and change that class model, because of course your tests are going to pass straight away, but your tests need to be a representation of the way that your customers or your API consumers are going to interact with your code. This uh, Separating these models from the API model and the implementation from the expectation model in the test is a good way to make sure that they um, can't accidentally change at the same time. The, API, the test model is always going to reflect the specification that your API consumers are expecting. And this way, uh, in this case, any accidental breakage of the model in the implementation will get flagged by the test straight away. So obviously now our student objects doesn't have a name, so let's give it a name. Uh, we add a name property. Uh, we allow it to be set in the constructor. We update our register static factory method. I really love static factory methods. They're just a way of giving a meaningful domain name uh, to the uh, code that's being uh, implemented here. And now yeah, this should make the test pass. Okay. So one other thing that I use, which is again a little bit of domain-driven design light and oriented around the language, is I've got an open source uh, plugin uh, for IntelliJ and VS Code called Contextive, and it allows you to put a YAML file that defines the terminology in your domain. So in this case, we've got a definition for the word student. If I hover over that, it gives me some extra information, like a definition for it, a person who would like to study a course, and uh, some usage examples, like how is this word used by domain experts when their day-to-day -day work? The student is registered at the university. The student is enrolled in the course. These are real sentences that somebody might say. I can hover over that in the YAML file, and I can get it. I can hover over it in um, my code files as well. I think this should work. Uh, we get that student there, and if I go to the controller, um, it also works here, register new student, because it's looking for just the text string. It's not looking for code elements like classes or method names. So it finds student and register and gives you all those definitions. And I found that this is really helpful for helping developers learn about the language, uh, embrace it, and use it more proactively in their code bases. So we're going to add a test for checking um, the register student details. So one thing you'll notice is that in our implementation so far, we have not got any persistence. We're literally just constructing the class and returning it. Uh, but that's because there's not been a test that has required us to have any persistence. All the, the only tests so far have just been asserting on the response. But now we're going to add a test that says, um, given I've registered when I check my details, which means we're going to take this location header, the, the new student location, uh, and we're going to do a get request on it 
to try and check if I post, uh, if I do a post to register a student and then I get the student back, do I get the same details? Now you would assume that this is gonna force me to do some persistence, but I've got a few other little TDD style tricks that mean we're gonna defer that just a little bit longer. Uh, but obviously the test fails now because there's no get, get uh, handler. Again, I'm gonna try and find the simplest implementation to make this pass. And because it should find the, stu new, the new student is really only expecting an okay result, all I have to do now to make the test pass is add a get student method um, with the ID and it just gonna, is gonna return a 200 okay. Still no need for any actual persistence. So we can go a little bit further and say, now we're going to actually pass in some uh, queries. We're gonna say it should find a new student and also it should, um, uh, we're gonna do a, bit, a little bit of encapsulation of the business logic in the test, a bit of refactoring there. Uh, the student details, it should confirm the new student details. So now we're saying, does the body contain the same name? Obviously that's gonna fail because we're just in the controller, we've just got the get method with nothing in there yet. So let's put some implementation. Who thinks that this is now gonna require me to have some persistence? Well, it doesn't because in my test, I just use a hard-coded name. So now I can return a student with a hard-coded name and I can make the test pass. Now I do this quite deliberately because it's about breaking down the steps of implementation. In this way, in this step, I'm able to test that the controller is correct, that the URL is correct, that the um, action is correct, that the schema of the payload is correct, and all of that is being tested by this test. And then it means that when I go to add the requirement for pers persistence, I can just do that one little bit of persistence work in isolation from all of the other work. So in this case now, in order to actually require persistence, I've parameterized the test with a value source. So still, that was just a refactor of the tests. No change here. We're still just testing it with test student. Now I'm gonna add another parameter, another student. And now finally, we're gonna have a test which can only realistically be passed by putting in some persistence because there's no way just from a GUID that I can um, infer in the controller which of these results to, um, to return unless I've actually stored the results of the registration request. So now this one is failing. Let's go back to the controller. And we're gonna do some persistence. So we've added a repository. And you can see here there was quite a bit of code added in that step because that was a little bit of a chunky um, addition. We're adding a repository, we're saving it in the get request, sorry, in the registration, uh, and then we're retrieving from the repository in the, um, in the get request, and now we get it there. And it was really helpful to have had all those other things taken care of in advance, and now just to be able to do that in one tiny little step. So now we've got the student name, given the student when I register. Now I'm gonna um, zip forward a little bit because there's a few other things uh, that need to happen here, but um, none of them are that interesting. Um, we're just gonna do a little bit of refactoring. So we've now got like a student URI method to encapsulate that servlet URI components builder. Um, we're going to um, add a test to get that an unknown student returns a 400, 404, and now we'll implement that because we need to say, instead of just or else throw, we can now return a response status exception. Um, we need to move all the students' tests in a subfolder because we're about to start adding tests for some other entities. So now we've got a student subfolder. By the way, that's a good prompt here. You might notice in here that I've got a students folder. Um, I've seen a lot of sample applications and if you're just getting started with this kind of thing, you'll probably see a controllers folder and a models folder um, and maybe a DTOs folder or a request response folder. I mean, that can work and it's a little bit uh, sometimes described as the hexagonal architecture or you might see it called ports and adapter or maybe clean. Um, I, like, I don't mind that approach, but, and you can tell I've still separated out here my persistence layer from my controller layer from my domain model, uh, but I just grouped them by domain concept. And to me, it's about which is your primary organizing principle versus which is your secondary organizing principle. Now, if you focus on the controller and the method and the DTO as your primary organizing principle, so the layers of your application, then what happens when you get a requirement change that relates to the domain object? You're probably gonna to have to go and make changes in all of those folders. Um, when I group them all together in the student's folder, when there's a change to the student, I'm gonna be making all of my changes just in this folder. So it's about bringing closer together the things that are likely to change at the same point in time. But depending on your application, you might find that actually the most, most of the changes you're, you're getting are operating at a layer rather than a slice. Um, and so you have to use your judgment about what's appropriate. But I usually find that in the early days of an application, most of the changes as we're experimenting and exploring the domain uh, are more likely to be oriented around a domain slice, and so I quite like this approach. Um, so we're gonna start testing tests for setting up a new room. Again, this is pretty much gonna follow exactly the same process as setting up a registering student, except we're using some new terminology. 
if I go in here now, we've got some terminology for the room and the capacity, and we describe it as uh, when we're setting up a room. So if we go into the rooms, you'll find I'm moving a little bit quickly now. Hopefully you're familiar with the uh, approach I'm following. So set up new room is the terminology we use now instead of post or create, um, and also different to the student, which was register. Um, so let's zip forward a little through, through this to get to uh, something a bit more interesting, which is when we're going to be creating the courses and linking them to the rooms. So uh, room details, parameterizing, you see sort of the same approach here. Really doesn't take that long. Start a test for including a course in a catalog. So now we've got a new domain concept here, the course, and we're including the course in the catalog. That's the domain operation that we're doing, uh, much like before starting with just a simple 201 response and then gradually building up the, the payload and everything. Location header, uh, seating details are confirmed. Uh, turn the course details. App test for checking existing courses. So we're looking for like the exception cases, 404, et cetera. Um, add test to confirm that a course can be linked to a room. So this is now getting a little bit more interesting. Oh, no, oh no, what did I do? Um, Luckily, my script will reset everything because sometimes I do make mistakes. Um, OK, so we've got a test here to say that a course can be linked to a room. Should be the, the new test here. Given I've included a course, when I check the course details, and it should confirm the course details now, it's going to say that the name matches and the room ID matches. And of course, that test is going to fail because I've just interrupted the flow here. Uh, and if we check the differences, uh, expected a GUID, got back null. You'll just have to believe me that that's on the, um, the room ID property. So close all tabs. If you look at the course, we just have a name as a property. So to implement that, we're going to add the room ID as a property and set it here. So again, the including catalog, static factory method again, pass in the name and the room ID. And in the course controller, in the including course catalog, we're calling it with the request get name, request get room ID, saving it and returning it. And that's all pretty straightforward. And now it should uh, mean that we get fully passing tests. Excellent. So let's move forward. Uh, we're going to add a test for when the room ID is not specified. So a bunch of extra edge cases, checking for a null room ID. Um, we have to add that validation logic in. We won't have a, a bad request response. Um, we're going to refactor now to use Spring Boot validation. Uh, which is going to require here that it's a valid response um, and that the course itself is going to have some validation, um, meaningful stuff on it. Where is it? Somewhere. Room ID not null there. Um, a test for an unroom room ID. Again, each of these edge cases, individual test, individual unit of behavior, add it and then make the code pass. Sometimes I describe this as being like your tests and your system are meant to be in balance with each other. And when you add a little bit of test, then you push the system out of balance. And then you make it pass, and you bring it back into balance. And if you write too big a test, then you're going to be really out of balance. It's going to be really hard to come back into balance, and you're probably going to be wobbling around a little bit. Or if you add too much code before writing your test, you're going to be really too far out of balance the other way, and then you're going to be doing your test after, and you really have no idea whether your tests are actually in balance with your implementation. So that's why um, I'm really taking pains to demonstrate here just how small um, each of the changes are. Uh, what have I done here? Made some accidental changes. Um, that's not how it's supposed to go. Here we go. So now we check the room ID in our controller before adding it to the catalog. So we're saying include a course. Now we've already moved it to spring validation, so we're not checking that again. But now we're saying, can we use the room repository to request by the room ID if it's not found? So or else throw, uh, respond with a bad request. And only if the room is valid, we're going to pass the room's ID in when we include the course. Um, so this is quite nice, and it makes it work. The test should pass now. But um, there's an alternative way to do this, which I quite like, which is to say, with the room repository, find by ID, we're actually getting back an optional room. Now, 
the optional room, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it allows you to basically say, well, it's, a, it's something that's sometimes called a maybe. It's a very functional idea. The idea is that there's a room object here, and it might be a room or it might be null. It's just an easier way of expressing things that could be null and allowing you to chain operations without having checked it. So now I can pass in course including catalog, uh, get name, and room. And then in the including catalog, I can map the room. Uh, so a map is an operation that will only do anything if room is not null. So it's a, it's a sum value, not a, mate, not a, null, non, not a none value, uh, depending on your functional language. Um, and then it returns that object. And then in the course controller, I can say or else throw. So if any of the map operations fail, it's going to be an or fall back to the or else and return a bad request. Now, this might look quite similar to what we had before. I'll just go backwards, I'll show you. Um, in that we had the or else throw here on the room repository. But the difference is, is that there's two things going on here. There's a bit of uh, infrastructure logic, which is deciding what should happen if the room is not found, which is that we should get a bad request. And then there's some domain logic, which is, well, what does it really mean to say that I'm setting up a course um, that's allocated to a non-existed room? So by encapsulating it into the including catalog method, I've put the business logic inside the room, the course entity, and I've put the infrastructure logic that maps it to the bad request up in the controller. And this is actually what they mean when they say port's an adapter. This is the adapter. The port is the provided by the infrastructure, by the Spring Boot uh, library. Um, this is my adapter, and I'm adapting it to the domain model in the heart, uh, which is provided by my course entity. So what this means now is that if there's more business logic that comes along that needs to be checked and validated during the including catalog operation, I never have to change this course controller. Um, because it's encapsulated here. It's business um, logic, and I can express it purely in terms of the domain concepts, not in terms of sort of infrastructure concerns at the same time. So it's a nice little thing there. Um, encapsulating the process of setting up a room, so a little bit of test refactoring. Uh, a few more steps. We're going to jump forward now to student enrollment. Um, so we're going to start going through the same process. Um, you'll see here we've now got an enrolling thing with an enrolling controller. Um, we're creating a new entity called an enrollment, which is the thing that links a student to a course. Uh, and as before, we're going to start building up step by step. We're just going to allow enrollments to get created without really any uh, rules. And then we can gradually start adding checks, like does the student exist? Does the course exist? Um, and then the location header, uh, checking and retrieving it, it's implementation for saving it. So we'll see here now we've got uh, Enrollments created and saved to the repository. I'm not going through this in detail because it's pretty much the same as what I did for the student before. But we are about to get to an interesting um, bit of code. So let me just go backwards here. Add test for failing enrollment if the course is full. This is really the meat and potatoes of the problem. If we go to enrolling tests, uh, we should have a thing here where we say, given the course I want is full when I enroll in a course. This is the next unit of behavior because we've already built up everything else that the application has to do. So we um, create a course, or we include a course in the catalog, and we set up a room. We link the course to the room when we set it up. Uh, we then uh, register a student and enroll it. So um, student, register student, enroll student in course, register student, enroll in course, register student, enroll in course. I've done it three times, because when I created the room, I had a capacity of three. And now I can finally assert that if I try a fourth enrollment, then it should not enroll me, and it should have an error. Now, of course, because we've not implemented any constraint, not implemented any check of the capacity, um, this test is going to fail because it's going to say, actually, you got, a, uh, you got a created response when you should have got a bad request response. OK, thank you. That is exactly what I expected at this point, which is nice. It tells me that my test is doing the right thing. And I'm going to go forward now and have a look at um, the enrollment controller. So now we've got a little bit more logic here. We say, let's get a count of the enrollments from the enrollment repository. Um, we're going to say, if the number of enrollments is greater than one, then get the capacity. Uh, if it's greater than the capacity, then we respond with a bad request. Now, this is a very naive implementation, and it's going to make it pass. Now, I kind of foreshadowed this earlier. I don't really like intermingling these sort of business rules in my infrastructure code that's worried about my request response statuses and so on. And in fact, a lot of this is kind of operating at that boundary of like technical validation and business rules validation. Um, so technically, the tests are passing. And now I'm in a really good position to start like hacking at this and refactoring it to make it look the way I want it to look. 
I really often try and do this as early as possible, as soon as I identify the opportunity for it to improve. And to sort of uh, offer an alternative metaphor to the one about balance, um, I'm reminded by my five-year-old daughter who uh, had a very interesting experience. She has a playroom at our house and she's terrible at keeping it tidy and so often it gets littered with toys all over the floor. Your feet get sore when you step on Lego and you know all the sorts of things. If there's any parents in the house, I'm sure you understand. Um, and one day it just got so bad and so messy, we just said we've got to spend the day cleaning this and we helped her out but it was very traumatic for her. She didn't like it. We weren't just doing it for her. We were trying to help her do it. It's a very painful experience. And we got to the end of the day and she said a very profound thing. She said, Daddy, next time I'm going to clean up my room when it's just a little bit messy because if I wait until it's really messy, it's just too hard. And I just thought, you've just described test-driven development to me <laughs> because every team that I know of that is facing oodles of technical debt uh, is just saying, it's just too hard to deal with now. We've let it get too big. It's exponentially grown, the complexity of the application, and we can't uh, wrangle it back into shape. But if you do these incremental steps and if you refactor as soon as you identify it, when the code is just the tiniest bit more messy than it was before, um, you're going to have a much better time, in my experience. So we've got this naive implementation. I'm going to do some refactoring to imp improve it. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, refactor the first step into the student repository, or sorry, the room repository, say so find for enrollment, so I don't have to have those two queries, because I used to have to go and get um, the course and then get the room. Uh, so that's a little bit of a cleanup. Uh, I'm going to, this count is a little bit clunky. Uh, I'm just not really sure I can follow it, so we're going to use like a spring magic query count by course ID, um, which is just a little bit nicer. Maybe if you're a spring uh, magician, you would have known to do that in the first instance, but for me, it took a bit of refactoring to find that this was a better implementation. Um, and then we're going to, this is the heart of the business logic here, so we're going to refactor this and put it in a method. Room would enrollment exceed capacity. It's a very simple piece of maths. We're just saying plus one greater than capacity. Um, but by putting it as a method on the room, we're starting to use that ubiquitous language to express the business rules in a way that a human can read them and it actually makes sense. If the room would exceed, uh, would enrollment exceed capacity with the current number of enrollments, then we have a bad request. Now, this is better, but it's not exactly what I'd love. What I'd really love is to be able to just say enrollment equals course.enroll student, and then that would just work. Um, unfortunately, as it happens, because we've got these relationships, uh, you know, the course doesn't necessarily have access to the data uh, about the room and its capacity or the number of enrollments, so we have to go and do those queries first and pass them in. Um, but, you know, potentially there are some better ways to do this. Um, at the very least, we've got this method here, uh, and it's just reverted that change. One thing we can do is we can refactor this into a, a new domain service called an enroller, and this actually really simplifies the controller. So I've taken all of that complex logic um, and put it onto an enroller class, which is sometimes called a domain service in the DDD lingo. And we've now just got the business logic here. It, we encapsulate some of the room repository queries. Um, we don't respond here with anything like an HTTP status code. We only respond with domain meaningful terms or maybe language construct meaningful terms, like exceptions um, or optionals. So we've got optional empty, optional of, uh, and there's a bit of a flat map here, so we can do the repository, um, we can map it. Uh, if it would exceed capacity, we return an empty, otherwise we return an optional of the actual thing. And then in the controller, it becomes a very simple, straightforward pattern. We do the repository find by ID or else throw. We do the enroller, enroll if enough capacity or else throw. So the technical layer is expressed in a simple way. We're just mapping from um, language constructs and domain concepts into the HTTP status codes, and in the domain level, where we've got this domain service of an enroller, um, we're putting in here the implementation logic that actually encapsulates the essential business rule here of this requirement. So do a little bit of a simplification here, sort of refactor the key steps, and now we can express it quite neatly. We say uh, room repository, find for enrollment, flat map it with check room capacity, and flat map it with enroll. Um, so it kind of just chains the operations here in a bit of a functional style, um, which I quite like. So the next thing that happens is we go, well, this is done, right? We've got our implementation. We can register students. We can set up uh, courses. We, uh, sorry, we can include courses in the catalog. We can set up rooms with capacities. When we set up courses, we link them to rooms, and we can accept enrollments in courses now. And if we get too many enrollments, um, it's going to fail because we've got this capacity check, and we are very confident in this because we run the tests, and they all show us that it's green. Um, Oh, not, I, went, I stepped too far forward, sorry. We say it, we test this and it's going to be all green. Uh, and then we go live with it and we say, hey, you can start using the application. Oh, 
we've still got a, uh, there's a bit of a, you have to wait sometimes for IntelliJ to catch up because I'm pushing changes through the Git. There we go. So all green, as promised. Um, but we push into production, we start getting uh, bug reports. So the, the specific bug report we, we get is that someone set up a course and they said uh, it was linked to a room and the room had a capacity of 20, but they got 21 enrollments. And you say, well, that can't be. I've got a test here that asserts that when I hit the capacity, it stop blocks the next enrollment. So what do you think is going on here in production? Race condition, exactly. Does everyone know what a race condition is? Um, if you're not familiar with it, what's basically happening in production, which is not in my tests, is I've got multiple users trying to enroll at the same time. And because of the way that I've implemented this capacity check, I'm going and retrieving the capacity, and then I'm processing the enrollment. If I have two requests coming at the same time, and they both go and retrieve the capacity and the current number of enrollments, so say we're at, we've got 19 enrollments, and I get two concurrent requests, they're both going to retrieve from the database. I've now got 19 requests. They're both going to evaluate their business logic and say, good to go. They're both going to create enrollments and persist them to the database, and we're going to end up with 21 enrollments. Now, obviously, this is not great, um, but because we're doing TDD, the first thing I'm going to do is create a test to try and simulate this situation to give me confidence that that's what's going on. So let's move forward, and we're going to add a concurrency test. So let's look at the enrollment, enrolling tests. And I've got a test at the bottom here now. Given the course I want is full when I enroll in a course concurrently. And the way we're doing this is really simple. Um, we use the completable future capability, um, which means we can enroll a student in the course with a and return a, using an async method, which is really just a completable future supply async wrapper around the existing synchronous enroll in student. It just means it doesn't wait for a response. And it will map the response to the future, which I can get the result at any time when I want to wait for it. But if I go enrolling tests, so I do the third enrollment and the fourth enrollment um, at the same time. And my expectation is that the enrollment response, which I get from the enrollment response future, um, should not enroll me with errors. Now, this is an interesting one. Because it's a race condition, it's not predictable. Sometimes when I run these tests, they all pass, uh, as seems to be the case this time. Sometimes when I run them, they fail. One nice thing that your IDE can help you with is that there is a uh, configuration, which I'll show you quickly if you're using IntelliJ. Test until failure is what I've called it, but it's using one of these options, which is repeat until failure. By default, this is set to once. So your tests are set to repeat just once. But I've set up a new test um, execution mode configuration that is going to say repeat the test until it fails. And by doing that, because I have a suspicion that there's a race condition, I can run this test now, and it's definitely going to guarantee me that it's going to keep running that test until it fails. And now I can be confident that this test is going to fail. Um, if I, it's unfortunate sometimes it doesn't tell you exactly how many times it took to fail, but if you run it in isolation, as we'll do here, so we can see here it um, passed after one. So just run it again. Like I said, it's, it's uh, is it not doing the thing? Is this the right one concurrently? What am I looking for? Sometimes it shows me how many times it executed. Oh, not to worry. Um, the key point is, is that because we know there's a concurrency or a race condition, by running it in a loop, we guarantee we're going to flush it out because it's just going to keep running until it fails. This is only really useful if you know the test is going to fail and you want to be confident because as soon as the test passes, this is going to run in a loop forever, um, which is obviously not what you want. But uh, if you're trying to flush out uh, a race condition, it's quite helpful. So what should we do about this race condition? How are we going to solve this problem? Yeah? So you could insert it and then check the count, and then if, you, if the count exceeds what you delete it, so like have a, a manual rollback. Is some sort of rollback, yeah, you could do that. So there's a variety of options. One is a, like an explicit solution like this. There are others where you can, sorry, you're going to suggest something? Yeah, dirty reads. Dirty reads. Um, I think about the, what we're experiencing right now is kind of an example of a dirty read, not at a database level, but at the application level. Um, but there's a thing that you can do called concurrency checks. So you can include uh, pessimistic or optimistic concurrency controls. Um, and what that does is it adds like a version uh, property to your entities, and you can say, uh, every time I do an update, increment the version, um, and then if the version uh, doesn't match what I get back, uh, you know, cause that to be some sort of a fault. Here, there's a bit of a tricky thing with that, because what we're looking for is a count, 
and so there's no entity that my version can be tracked on. In the domain-driven design world, this is what's known as an aggregate. So we're in an aggregate in the DDD world is called a is another word for, in the implementation sense, a transactional consistency boundary. We're looking for a boundary around our data and our behavior that needs to be transactionally isolated, that needs to be serialized in terms of the changes. And this particular example is one of the tricky ones that sometimes sips through people's um, grasps because it's not about a specific entity. It's about a collection of entities and it's hard to sort of monitor what's the change to the collection. But you know, it is a solvable problem. We could introduce a new entity. Uh, we could potentially increment a version count on the course itself every time an enrollment comes in. And so if the course version number has, has uh, incremented uh, in, while one of the operations is proceeding, then we could fail it. You know, and that does work uh, in that the 21st student to enroll, uh, whoever loses the race would get told with an error reset message, sorry, you can't enroll, the course is full, and which would probably be quite frustrating uh, because they would say, well, why did you even let me try? Why did you let me try if you were gonna tell me that I can't do it? Um, and so this is where I think actually domain-driven design comes into its strength. Because what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go back to our um, uh, domain model, and I'm gonna show you an alternative domain model approach. This is called event storming. It's come out of the domain-driven design community, and the idea is that it introduces uh, the notion of time into our domain model. The domain model that we saw before, this one, very static. It just shows you a bunch of entities and relationships. It doesn't tell you how it changes or evolves over time. But with this one, we can see how it changes over time. These orange are meant to be sticky notes. Um, the idea is that you get a bunch of people in a room, including domain experts, and you say, just start putting sticky notes on the wall in roughly the sequence within which things happen. Now, in this really simple model, the way that we can read this is that the first thing that happens is a room is set up, then a course is included in the catalog, uh, there's a constraint there that it must be allocated to a room, and then a student is registered, and then they're gonna enroll in the course, and there's a constraint there that we can't overfill the room. And this makes a lot of sense, and it allows people to visualize the business process that's going to happen, but in a way that's much more lightweight than traditional formal business process modeling tools. Um, you know, you might be familiar with some of the UML notation or BPMN or things like that. Um, they were often very off-putting to the domain experts. They couldn't interpret them. This, this event storming approach is really lightweight. It's very easy to explain to the domain experts what it means. And, very, and straight away, they would look at this and go, no, this is not what we wanted at all. This is not what we expected how this system would work. And when you ask them to explain, they start shuffling the sticky notes around, and they say, actually, what we wanted was this. Uh, we want to set up the room. We want to include the course in the catalog. At this point, we actually don't care if the course is allocated to a room. Then we want the students to register and we want them to enroll. And then we want to look at which courses are most popular. And we want to allocate the popular courses to the biggest rooms. And you realize this makes a lot of sense. The constraint that we can't overfill the room is still there. We're just enforcing it later in the process. We're not enforcing it at the time of student enrollment. We're enforcing it later when we do the scheduling algorithm to allocate the courses to rooms. And this gives them a much more effective resource utilization because say there was some, you know, really unpopular course that nobody signed up for, like you know, new features in Java 22, um, but maybe a really popular course, like uh, you know, uh, Gods and Monsters in ancient Roman mythology, and uh, they happen to misplan the popularity and they assigned one to a room with 100 capacity and the other one to a room with 10 capacity, but of course, you know, 90 people got rejected from one and the other one ended up with an empty theater with only 10 seats filled. Obviously, that's not what the business experts want. It's not what the domain experts want. But because when we started, we thought, oh, this is just really simple. We're just gonna draw this static diagram. And because at some point in the process, the course does need to be allocated to a room, we just whacked it in there as a relationship and said, well, of course, we must allocate the course to the room. We made an assumption about the domain because we didn't explore the domain properly with the domain experts. And this is what I love about domain-driven design, is that it goes through this process and you learn so much about the domain. You learn about what it means, what's important to the domain experts, um, and how to think about how your application is going to guide people through a process and not just be a simple CRUD data collector. So what are we gonna do about this? We obviously have to go back. Well, sorry, one extra thing is what this highlights is that there can be some parallelization in the process. They don't even need to set up the rooms until they're regularly ready to run the scheduling algorithm. So they can wait and see how many enrollments they get before they even decide how many rooms they need to request from the university or uh, whatever it is. So this is obviously a much more flexible process. Um, and the nice thing is it's simpler to implement as well because we can avoid these technical constraints that we had, like a transactional consistency boundary. And I so often see teams, they bump into a requirement where there's a transactional consistency boundary, and then they just go and pour oodles of effort into technical solutions like concurrency controls or other forms of resiliency um, that are actually just 
reinforcing a mistake in the understanding of what the business really wanted. And when you go back and interrogate and understand what the business wanted, you find out that there were much simpler and more valuable solutions available to you the whole time. So let's go back to our code. So we're going to start removing some of this capacity. So we've added this concurrency test. We don't need it anymore because we're not even going to handle this, concurren this um, constraint check at the time of enrollment. So we're going to remove the concurrency check. Um, and we're going to remove the functionality in associated with checking the enrollment capacity. Now, this one is also something that uh, sometimes people get a little bit confused about because the TDD process is write a test, write some code, red, green, refactor. Um, but the thing that's interesting is that actually what is far more important than write a test is go red. So how do you make an application go red if you're trying to remove functionality? You can't remove the test because it's going to stay green. Right? If you just remove the test first, the code will still be green, and you won't know, have I removed enough of the application yet? So what I like to do is actually remove the functionality associated with the requirement, but keep the tests there. Again, it's this balancing act, but this time we're going in the other direction. No tests found. What's going on here? Oh, this is because I'm still in my... Um, so I have to go back to this one. There we go. You can tell me what I've done wrong here. Oh, I'm still in the wrong tab. Thank you. <laughs> Let's do this one. There we go. There's always someone who's paying closer attention than I am, which is great. Um, so I've removed the functionality, and now the tests have gone red, given the course I want is full when I enroll in a course, which is good because I've removed that constraint. That's exactly the test I expected to go red. So that's my first step. I've made the system go red in the way I wanted it to go red. And now I remove the test and now it's going to go green. So now that we've done that, the next thing, um, so we can actually remove the functionality for setting a course room ID, remove the test for setting the room ID on a course, and we can start testing the scheduling process. So we've got a whole new domain concept here called scheduling um, with uh, some scheduling tests. And again, we're going to start with very simple. We're just going to test that the API returns OK. I'm not going to make you watch that stuff again. It's very straightforward. We're going to add the controller and the route. Um, add something to the definitions file, uh, add tests for the contents, and a naive implementation to verify the response structure. So we actually got a test now where we say we're going to set up, um, a register a student, include a course, um, enroll the student in the course, uh, set up a room, and then call the scheduler algorithm, uh, and then it should schedule the course. Now, the thing that I've done here is I've set up a test that is very, very simple because I know I haven't implemented the whole capability. If I go up to the scheduling controller, it's literally the simplest thing you can look at. It's just going to create uh, a dummy hard-coded course and a dummy hard-coded room, allocate the course to the room, um, and that's the scheduling activity itself, and then re respond with the payload that it needs to. But the nice thing here is that this test is always going to be a valid test, even when I've got a more complex implementation, because by just setting up one student, one course, one room, with a capacity of three. Uh, if that's all that exists, then of course it should allocate that course to that room. So this is always going to be a valid result. And this is something about TDD that's really important, is that it should always be a valid result, no matter what, even if you're starting with a very simple implementation. But now we can make it get more complex. Um, we can add a unit test around an independent scheduler. So this is actually the point where some people might have noticed that all my tests so far have been at the API level which might have been confusing because you think TDD, I should be writing unit tests around classes, why am I doing API tests? In my experience, this has been historically a trade-off between performance and refactorability of the application. The higher level your tests, the more of the application is covered under the ability to refactor without breaking the tests, but also you lose localization of the failure. If a test fails, you don't know where in the stack the failure has occurred. So far, I haven't really had any deep stacks, so I've been quite comfortable to just write those tests at the API level. I'm now getting to the point where I have a very complex scheduling algorithm. Um, I want to add some tests around that scheduling algorithm. If I implement API level tests, it's going to take a lot of effort to set up the scenario that I want to test for that algorithm. Um, and also, it's going to make it harder for me to spot where in the algorithm has the, has the issue for, um, occurred. So now I'm finally going to actually write a test which is just around a thing, oh, cancel, around a class called a scheduler. So I've got scheduling tests, which test the business process, and a scheduler test, which literally creates a new instance of the scheduler, 
And it, instead of having to set up all of those details, students and courses and whatnot, I can just pass in the summary data that I have, which is a, the course and the number of enrollments that it has, because that's all the algorithm needs. So I can isolate down the data that this algorithm needs, and I can do a test in this way. But I don't do this for every single class, because it's a complete waste of time for most classes. But for this kind of class that's going to encapsulate some complex business logic, it actually makes sense. So we're going to have a test here. Um, which is obviously going to pass, uh, sorry, fail because we haven't implemented the scheduler algorithm. I'm going to have to zip through this uh, pretty quickly now because I'm getting close to running out of time. Um, but let me just show you how this ends. So here's our scheduler, literally does nothing, turns null. We're going to add some more complex implementations. So maybe we, we implement just a simple algorithm that only works for a single room and a single course. Then we're going to add a requirement in a test for two courses and two rooms, um, which is going to fail because we're going to specifically choose the um, test scenario that causes them to be inverted. So we have a two course, two room test where we say we have a capacity, we have four enrollments and uh, two enrollments, but then we have capacity two, capacity four. So the naive zip that just maps them one to one is going to fail. And then we can implement a more complex algorithm here, which is going to start checking the capacity and all that sort of stuff. So you can see here, again, we're building up tiny step by tiny step. Uh, we're going to extract some methods out of this to make it a little bit easier to read. Again, we're going to turn the courses into a stream and use that sort of functional mapping and flap mapping approach. Um, and eventually, uh, add some more um, uh, test assertions, uh, more complex scheduling results with multiple things and link it to the API. And finally, wire up the scheduler controller with the scheduler service so that we can do that. And here, I've really only got one test around the controller, which just asserts that it's actually using the scheduler, and then all of the complex scenario tests are around the scheduler. Um, and the final thing we're going to do, which is the thing that actually is going to make some people feel more comfortable about the fact that I'm calling this domain-driven design, is that we've taken all of our entities and replaced the setters, or sorry, the um, uh, made the setters private. They were public, we've made them private now, uh, which means that we've effectively encapsulated anything that can change the state of the entity. I do apologize, I've gone slightly over time. I understand some people probably want to get to the next talk. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up very quickly now. This is a QR code to the GitHub repository for this. If you'd like to go and review it, you can go back through and see the whole history of every individual step. I'll just leave that a second if anyone wants to open that up. Um, if you're interested in that contextive plugin that gives you that domain terminology definition, there's a QR code here, or you can just Google it on the IntelliJ um, extension store uh, for contextive. It's pretty new in IntelliJ, so please do raise an issue if you have any problems with it. Um, I don't guarantee that it works perfectly in IntelliJ. Um, if you're interested in learning more about domain-driven design, I do run a training course uh, in collaboration with um, Domain Driven Design Europe and DDD Academy, which does more like high-level strategic analysis of domain driven design. Um, it's a pretty good course and I recommend checking it out. It doesn't go into the code level as we've just been doing today, but more at like large-scale analysis and some event storming practice. And finally, I'd love to chat. You can probably tell I'm quite passionate about these topics. If anyone wants to connect with me, LinkedIn, Mastodon, um, or my website there, very happy to, to have a chat about any of these topics anytime. TDD, DDD, uh, high quality code, all that stuff is very exciting to me. Um, but with that, thank you very much for your attention. I uh, appreciate you coming to the course and uh, happy to chat in the hallway afterwards as well. Cheers. <laughs>